Oh, hello. <laughs> it's time for another video. So far we've talked about uh, what music is, uh, which is it's an art based on the organization of sounds in time. Isn't that right, Katie? She's wagging her tail. That means yes. Uh, and we started to talk about what sound is. Um, specifically, uh, we talked about the fact that there are essentially, for our purposes, two kinds of sounds. There's tones, which we could also call them pitches. Those are produced by regularly occurring vibrations, vibrations that occur at some steady rate, which we could measure, and we measure them in cycles per second or hertz. <clears throat> and I mentioned that the human hearing range, for example, goes from 20 cycles per second, 20 vibrations of, of an object, uh, every second, creating a pressure wave in the air that travels into our eardrum. Uh, from 20 cycles per second up to around between 20 and 30,000 cycles per second. That's the pitch range that the human ear is capable of producing. And then we also have noises, sounds which are caused by disordered or irregular or chaotic vibrations. And both of them have a use in music. Um, now, what we're going to talk about today is not so much the high and low, quote unquote. Remember, there's really no high or low about it. When we're talking about pitches. What we're talking about is um, higher frequency. In other words, if we were to graph a frequency visually, um, we could call it higher. But what it really represents is a greater number of pulses within a given period of time. That's what creates a higher pitch. If we have fewer pulses in a given time, we have a lower pitch, and that's why we call it frequency. We're talking about how frequently these vibrations happen in time. That's what I covered last time. That's what gives us differences in pitch. <clears throat> Today I'm going to talk about differences in volume. And uh, just for the sake of reference, I am still pretty early on in the book. I'm over here on page 6. Uh, and the first thing you'll see is they don't really use the word volume, they use the word dynamics. Uh, dynamics is basically the fancy classical word for volume. We tend to use the word dynamics or dynamic level rather than volume. So if I have a piano student, for example, <clears throat> and she is playing too loud, I'll say your dynamic level here is piano, and yet you are playing forte. So we'll talk about that. We'll also learn a little bit of Italian. So those two words that I just said, piano and forte, are Italian words. <clears throat> We're going to learn a few more Italian words, and, uh, and that will probably uh, suffice for this lecture. And then the next lecture, we'll talk about this very mysterious third quality of sounds, which is tone color or timbre. So that's going to be next lecture. Um, so. Volume, or dynamics, whatever you want to call it, is a function of the amplitude of the sound wave. So remember, <clears throat> pitch is a function of, or is determined by, the frequency of the sound wave. But volume, or dynamic level, is a function of the amplitude of the sound wave. And right there, there's a clue for you, because of course, uh, with an amplifier, you can make sounds uh, louder. So just think, amplitude corresponds to volume or dynamics. Um, if you look on D2L, I posted a link to a very short video which demonstrates this uh, very well and has fancy graphics. Now I have some very crude graphics, which I just made, which illustrate the difference. Um, on the left there, I have a, a graph of a sound wave. Now, on this axis, the E stands for energy. We have to impart a certain amount of energy into something in order to get it vibrating, okay? And once those vibrations happen, they are transferred to the air, the air vibrates, our eardrums vibrate, etc., and we detect a sound. Now, in this case, I'm showing a difference in pitch, so we go from um, a lower frequency to a higher frequency, but the volume is the same, right? 
the amount of energy is staying consistent. It's just that down here on this axis, the time axis, the pulses suddenly start occurring more frequently in time, about halfway across this graph. Okay. Notice also something I forgot to mention last time. Another way of understanding frequency is to speak in terms of wavelength. They are really two different terms for describing the same thing. A wavelength is the distance from one peak of a wave to the peak of the next wave, or it could be the valley of a wave to the valley of the next wave. That's one wavelength. And wavelength and frequency obviously have a relationship to each other. If you have waves occurring less frequently, that means there's going to be more length. And again, it's, <clears throat> it's really a time thing, but we're graphing it, we're making it visual, so it looks like a space thing, it looks like length. <clears throat> it's, uh, it's more length between those peaks because the waves are occurring less frequently. Therefore, we could say a longer wavelength corresponds to um, a lower frequency. Over here, you can see that the distance between those peaks is much shorter. So that's a shorter wavelength and therefore a higher frequency. Over here, however, you can see that I've tried to keep the <clears throat> wavelength, the distance between peaks, more or less the same. So the frequency is the same. So this is what we're seeing here is a sound wave where the pitch remains consistent, but the amplitude is suddenly greater because you can see those waves suddenly get much taller. Right? So we are seeing here a sudden increase in volume or in dynamic level. Okay? <clears throat> now. Keep in mind, again, sound waves don't really look like this. Uh, it's just that this is a nice simplified way of depicting them. It's hard for me to draw a three-dimensional pressure wave moving through the air. Right? So instead I use this simplified thing that looks more like water waves. So that's, it's fairly simple. That's what dynamics is. Differences in dynamics or volume are simply differences in the amount of energy that is producing the wave, totally regardless of what the, the pitch or what the frequency of the wave might be. It's like you, you might be sitting there at the beach um, watching as waves roll in from the shore and they're coming in at a steady rate. Let's say one wave every 10 seconds. And they're coming in one wave every 10 seconds, but suddenly the waves go from being little ripples <clears throat> to being big rolling breakers uh, that you could surf, okay, that would be like an, an increase in volume, okay? Now, um, because Italian is traditionally the language of music, it, it has been for a very long time. Now, I should say that at, beginning in the 19th century, and this has to do with, uh, it has to do in part with nationalism, phenomenon of the 19th century, which we will get to at the end of the semester when we cover that historical period. Some composers began putting little directions in their music, instead of in Italian, in their own native language, in German, in French, what have you. But traditionally, Italian has been sort of like the language of music. That is, if I'm writing a piece of music, and I want to indicate something that it is difficult or impossible to indicate using standard music notation. That is, you know, a staff and notes and all that stuff. <clears throat> I need to write some kind of instructions, maybe having to do with how fast or how slow the piece is, how loud or how soft it is. Any, anything that requires words, composers, no matter what their own nationality, tended to use Italian. Right, so we're going to start to learn some Italian in this class. And <clears throat> actually at this point, uh, I want to introduce a little bit of that, uh, the subject matter from my other little lecture series that I have going on on learning. Uh, because whenever we learn a new term, an unfamiliar term, especially one that's in a foreign language, what I see a lot of the time is that um, students will, especially if it's in a foreign language, they are kind of afraid of that foreign word and they kind of keep it at arm's length. They're like, get, 
get away from me, foreign word. I don't want to know about you. Maybe I'll try and remember the first couple letters. But And this is a, a totally wrong approach. The opposite would be better. You should embrace that word, meaning <clears throat> you should try and spell it correctly. You should even try and pronounce it correctly. And I'm going to show you how to pronounce some Italian words correctly. And most importantly, whenever possible, you should see if you can find a connection between that foreign word that you don't know and maybe some word in the English language that you do know, or at least similar to a word that you do know. And whenever that, whenever that's possible, I am going to point those out to you. Because again, if you, if you watch the lecture that I uh, recorded last night <clears throat> um, on learning, uh, and I talked about how the way we learn really is to understand and then remember, and the process of understanding is basically infusing that which was meaningless and unfamiliar and meaningless. We've got to infuse it with meaning and significance so that it can stick to some part of our brain. It can stick to something we do know. We take what we don't know and we stick it to something we do know, and that's how we learn. Okay? So, I'm going to do that with, with a bunch of Italian words uh, right now. In the book, <clears throat> you can see they, they list the most common Italian dynamic markings. And I'm just going to run through them for you. If you have your book open, maybe if you have a, a, uh, an extra tab open, if you have the e-book, e I'm just going to go through these. Now, the book has them listed from soft to loud. Right. And it also has abbreviations for each of those markings down the middle column because composers sometimes don't like to write out the entire word. They'll write an abbreviation. And then they have the English translation. But I, I'm not going to I'm not going to run through them in that order. Actually, I'm going to simplify things a little bit for you. Um, we're going to focus on two words, and those words are piano and forte. Piano, you might think, oh yeah. Piano, that's an instrument. I know what a piano is. Actually, the name of the instrument, uh, it, it comes from the dynamic level. The dynamic level, or the word piano, which means quiet or soft, came first. And then later, around the year 1700, when someone invented this instrument, an Italian guy named Bartolomeo Cristofori, he called this instrument the keyboard instrument which can play soft and loud the gravicembalo piano e forte. Piano means soft, forte means loud. And what was new about the piano back 300 years ago was that just with a touch of your finger, pressing down harder, pressing down softer, you could play loud and you could play soft. And that was a new thing that was not possible with previous keyboard instruments like the organ or the harpsichord. Those instruments are not touch sensitive. Now, I'm getting a little ahead of myself because I'm talking about keyboard instruments, but I'm trying to relate uh, something you already know, which is the word piano. Piano means soft, and it meant that long before anyone invented this thing. So piano means soft or quiet. Forte means loud. And this is a word actually you're familiar with. First of all, the word literally means strong not loud. It's just that we kind of interpret it to mean if you're playing strong, then you're playing loud. And there are lots of words, actually, that, that have that root. So, for example, a fort. We all know what a fort is. What a fort is, it's a stronghold. It is a strong place that is difficult for an army to conquer and to take, right? Um, you might have heard somebody say, oh, wait, wait a minute, math is not my forte, what they're saying is math is not my strength, right? So forte means strong, but in a musical sense, that means loud. So we have these two basic words, piano and forte. Now, anytime in Italian we want to make something extreme, we simply add the suffix issimo. Issimo means very. So pianissimo means very soft. Fortissimo means very loud. Pretty simple, right? Issimo means extremely. And then we have another word for medium, and that is mezzo. 
M-E-Z-Z-O. And when you see that word mezzo, don't think mezzo. Don't pronounce it like an American. What the Italians do, unlike, you know, English-speaking people, when they have two consonants in a row, like two Z's in a row, they actually pronounce both of them. They say mezzo, right? Mezzo, not mezzo, right? So mezzo piano means medium soft. Mezzo forte means medium loud. It's kind of hard for me to, uh, to, to make a connection between the English medium and the Italian mezzo, but I'm going to try my best. Um, first of all, they both start with the same two letters, M-E, and they are related linguistically. About the best example I can think of is if you've ever been in a big theater or a concert hall that has a, like a ground level and a balcony, in between there may be a mezzanine. The mezzanine is the middle level sort of balcony. It's in between the floor level and the, the balcony proper. So that's about the best I can do. But mezzo means medium or middle. By the way, I also used that term mezzo in describing voice ranges uh, in a previous lecture, the last lecture. Remember I said that the, the medium uh, voice range for women is mezzo-soprano. Right, the highest is soprano, uh, the lower voice is alto, and in between we have mezzo-soprano, medium soprano. So that word mezzo is used in both cases. Right? We have a couple of other words here. A crescendo, crescendo, uh, and again, don't look at it and say cres crescendo, crescendo, try and say it like an Italian, you can use your hands if that helps, crescendo. Um, is an increase in volume. And in fact, the word increase and crescendo are essentially the same word, just in two different languages. Don't let the lack of a few letters or the different spelling throw you off. It's simply the, the Italian word for increase, crescendo. A decrease in sound is a decrescendo. D, just like in, in English, the the prefix de often means the opposite of. So if crescendo is an increase in volume, decrescendo is a, is a decrease in volume. We have another word actually for a decrease in volume. Diminuendo means exactly the same thing. Okay, so we have two different words for the same exact thing. Diminuendo, this is again, this word should not be all that challenging to you because if you think of something that diminishes, right? Actually, the root there is the M-I-N, same with minus, if something is minimized, right? If, if you know somebody who is diminutive, who is small, right, that's the same word, essentially. Diminuendo means a decrease in volume. Okay. Um, speaking of dynamics, somewhere in this text also, uh, they define a dynamic accent, a dynamic accent is when we make one note in particular louder than the notes around it. So we're not really gradually increasing or decreasing or whatever. We are, we are making one note stand out by playing it louder. Right? So that's what we call an accent, or more specifically, a dynamic accent, because we are accentuating a note by playing it louder than the other notes around it. Right? Um, so there we have dynamics in a nutshell, um, and that didn't take as much time as I, as I thought it would. So maybe I will move on to start to talk about tone color. All right, now tone color is a very complex thing. Right? And in a way, if you think about it, remember my where did I put it? <laughs> My waveforms here. I want you to think about something for a second. If this is all there is to sound, right? We have an object that is vibrating. Could be a piece of metal, could be a piece of wood or whatever. It's causing the air around it to vibrate. And it will vibrate at a certain rate. That's what we call the frequency. Slower, faster, or whatever in time. And it will vibrate with a certain amount of energy less over here, more over there. And that's what gives us differences in volume. 
Now, if this were, if this is all there is to sound, and it seems like, I mean, so far that's that's all that we've learned about. It seems pretty straightforward. Okay, you got stuff vibrating. It vibrates either uh, fast or slow, gives us differences in pitch. It vibrates either with great energy or with less energy, that gives us differences in volume. It's pretty much all there is to it, right? But if that were the case, why is it that we can hear different qualities of sound? Why is it that a trumpet sounds different from a guitar, sounds different from an oboe, sounds different from a piano? How come we can hear differences in quality of sound, what we call tone quality or sometimes called tone color? Right? It should be impossible because we only have two parameters going on here, right? Uh, we, have, we only have two axes on our graph. We have energy, we have time. We can manipulate energy, we can manipulate time, and therefore we can explain differences in frequency, we can explain differences in volume, but how can we explain differences in tone quality or tone color? Well, uh, you might have guessed intuitively, just from, based on a lifetime of hearing different musical sounds, that it has something to do with the way the sound is produced. That's true. Like, are we plucking a string? Or are we uh, blowing into a tube and causing a, a column of air to vibrate? Or are we uh, hitting an object, like a drum or a table or whatever? Um, so we have different ways of initiating the sound. And then we also have different materials that could be vibrating, like wood or metal or what have you. And all of that must have something to do with it. And you're right, it does. But still, I mean, these are the only parameters we've got to work with. How is it that we get differences in tone color or tone quality? This is something that the that is so complex, actually, that the book doesn't even really get into it. The book just gives you a definition for this thing, tone color or tone quality, two words for the same thing, or timbre. Timbre is a funny word, T-I-M-B-R-E. It looks like timbre, but it's pronounced timbre. These three words, tone color, tone quality, timbre, three different words for the same thing. And the book just kind of doesn't even bother trying to tell you the reasons for it. It simply says um, the quality, that just, it says here, we can tell a trumpet from a flute even when each of them is playing the same tone at the same dynamic level. So this is kind of fascinating. You could, you could have a trumpet player and a flute player and a violin player, whatever. And if they were really good at their instrument, you could hit a, uh, you could set up uh, sophisticated measuring instruments to determine the exact frequency and the exact volume that they're playing. And you could say, okay, flute player, I want you to play A440, and I want you to be right there on pitch. I'm going to have a machine here so that you can see whether you're off a little bit or right on pitch. And we'll have a decibel meter there so we can see exactly how many decibels of amplitude or volume. And we could have that flute player play a certain pitch at a certain volume. And we could have the trumpet player play the same pitch at the same exact volume. And yet we would easily be able to tell the difference between the two of them. Uh, and the reason has to do with the fact that Sound waves are not so simple like this. Even waves on the ocean, which really are uh, just kind of like, you know, moving in two dimensions, are not so simple like this. If you look at a wave on the ocean, like if you try and, you know, if, if you were painting waves, you know, you're making a little drawing of a sailboat, you might have simple waves that kind of look like this, that they'd be more pointy, right? Um, but what do waves look like in real life? Well, you've got the main wave, and then you've got little ripples on the wave, and then there's little ripples on those ripples. And if you could keep, if you could use a, a microscope and keep examining, you would find ripples on ripples on ripples on ripples. Right? What these ripples 
uh, are, are, they're called overtones or partial tones. We've got a main wave that's called the fundamental, right? The main wave is producing the fundamental tone. But each of the ripples are also producing tones. They don't have nearly the amplitude of the main wave. They aren't nearly as loud, but they are there. And there are hundreds, thousands of these little teeny tiny waves that are kind of riding the main wave. Another way to think about this, by the way, is imagine you've got a jump rope, big long jump rope, and it's going up and down. That's like the main wave. But imagine that as this rope is going up and down, it's also doing double dutch as it goes. It's dividing itself exactly in half, and each half is also going up and down as the entire rope goes up and down. Now imagine that the rope is also somehow dividing itself in thirds, and each third of a wave is going up and down, and it's also dividing itself in fourths, and each fourth of a wave is going up and down. Each of these smaller divisions of the main wave has much less amplitude, but when you combine them all together, right, the differences, the very slight differences in amplitude from one set of overtones to the next set, to the next set, to the next set, is what gives us differences in tone color. Right? Now that might have been kind of hard to follow. You might want to rewind uh, this uh, lecture and, and, and uh, play it again. And it's, it's pretty complex. That's why the book doesn't really go into it. The book just says the, the difference you hear uh, between a violin and a trumpet, that's tone color, that's timbre. And that's, that's true, but it doesn't tell you why. Right? Um, now, everything in nature that vibrates creates these overtones. It's unavoidable, right? So for example, you might, you might say, well, wait a minute, I think I, could, I think I could get out of this. I think I could create a pure tone if I had, let's say, a synthesizer. If I had some kind of electronic piece of equipment that could generate this wave, which is very easily to do with very primitive electronics, you can send current through a circuit board and get a wave that looks like this. And then it would be just a matter of, well, hooking that thing that's generating this wave into an amplifier, right? And then from the amplifier into a set of speakers, and I should get a perfectly clean sound wave with no overtones on it because I didn't program any overtones in. Now you can do that and you can come very, very close, actually. What you end up getting is what sounds to us intuitively like a fake synthesized sound. Sort of like um, the sound that you used to hear from fax machines. I don't know if you guys are old enough to have ever seen a fax machine. Or the sound that you used to hear from the emergency broadcast system. This is a test of the emergency broadcast system. This is only a test. Right? When they used to do that, when I was a kid, and we were all afraid that we were going to be nuked into oblivion at any moment, they had this thing called the emergency broadcast system. They still have it now, I think, but they don't do it the same way. When we were a kid, you'd be listening to the radio and say, this is a test of the emergency broadcast system. And then they would play this tone on the radio that sounded like this. Okay. That... Uh, what I'm doing when I make that tone, now I'm not consciously trying to do this, I'm just trying to make a fake sounding electron, an unnatural sound. What I'm really doing is I'm trying to suppress the overtones to the greatest extent, right? That's how we can tell, by the way, when, when you are listening to a piece of music or a sound and you can tell somehow intuitively that it's an electronic sound, that it's a sound that is not really natural. The way that you can tell that is because your brain detects the diminished overtones. The fact that um, there are fewer overtones than uh, you would normally expect to hear in a natural sound. Right? Um, and so, for example, if you like music from the 80s, uh, I was about your age in the late 80s, they, they loved synthesized sounds and they actually liked these kind of fake artificial sounds 
Uh, in fact, you still you hear some of those kind of those tones in, in popular music today. Uh, part of the reason they sounded that way in the 80s is because the the synthesizers and whatnot that they had were much less sophisticated. They had analog synthesizers. This is before the digital age. Okay. Um, and so it, going back even further into the 50s and 60s, the early days of the synthesizer, you could probably, I'll, I might put up a link to uh, uh, an early Moog synthesizer from the 60s, and they sound somehow obviously fake and artificial. And if you were to ask someone who doesn't know, you know, might not know anything about music, they might say, oh, I don't know anything about music, but that sounds weird to me. It sounds fake and artificial. That's basically what they're saying. Uh, they don't know it consciously, but what they are hearing is that there don't seem to be enough overtones, or the overtones are not present enough for it to sound natural. Right? Now, this is something we'll talk a little bit more when we get into electronic instruments. As computing power greatly increased, and as we enter the digital age, when a, what, a machine we call a sampler, or basically a digital recording device, could listen to something and really follow the very uh, complex profile, the, the sort of fingerprint of that wave. Every little twist and turn of those very fine ripples on ripples on ripples of that sound wave, now the, the, the sound starts to be more natural and convincing, right? To the point that now, with you know, the, the synthesizers and samplers we have now, it can be difficult to tell between, let's say, a real violin sound and a synthesized uh, violin sound or a sampled violin sound. We'll talk about what sampling is, what synthesizers are um, in a future lecture. Um, just, But just think of it this way. Each of these simple looking sound waves, they don't really look like this. It's, a, it's just a terribly complex pattern of squiggles on squiggles on ripples that are riding this main wave, right? And every different material has its own sort of fingerprint. In fact, um, let's take something like wood. It's not just the case that wood has its own fingerprint. Different kinds of woods have their own distinctive sound fingerprint, produce their own timbre, and therefore, let's say violin makers or piano makers uh, use certain woods and not other woods because of their sound quality. Right? Even, for example, the grain of the wood matters. So um, piano manufacturers, for the sound boards of their piano, it's a big speaker basically inside the piano. It's, it's exactly in the shape of the piano, right underneath the strings. Um, they have guys who work for these piano manufacturers who, whose job it is to examine big pieces of spruce coming right off a boat somewhere in Alaska. And they are looking at these pieces of wood to see if the grain is straight. Um, because if the grain isn't straight, if there are knot holes or whatever, then it impedes the flow of the, of the vibrations and thus it messes up the sound wave and it's not gonna make for a very nice sounding piano, right? Um, so this is something that instrument manufacturers have paid a great deal of attention to for hundreds and hundreds of years, right? Um, now, discussing tone color or timbre leads naturally into a discussion of all of the different instruments, right? Um, and I will tackle that in a future lecture, but it's pretty simple. Um, I want you to read through the section on the different instruments, and instead of taking one instrument at a time and, and uh, you know, examining them one at a time, I want you to think in terms of the families of instruments first. Uh, try and learn, by this is one of my learning tips, try and learn top down in an organized way, right? Don't just learn one thing at a time, try and structure. If you have some large subject that you're gonna learn like uh, all the different musical instruments, at least the Western musical instruments, right? Because even this, this book doesn't begin to cover it. There are so many non-Western uh, or instruments that are not a part of the traditional orchestra. We're just going to focus on mostly the instruments that are part of the traditional Western, that is European-based symphony orchestra, and there's a lot of them. So in order to keep them straight, in order to kind of organize them, 
all you got to do is think of four main groups. And those are stringed instruments, woodwind instruments, brass instruments, and percussion instruments. Now, there are also some subcategories off of those. So, for example, for stringed instruments, there are those that are bowed, played with a bow, and those that are non-bowed. For woodwind instruments, you have some woodwind instruments that require a reed. We'll learn what a reed is. There are reed instruments and non-reed instruments. Within the reed instruments, there are some instruments that are double reed and some that are single reed. Uh, the brass instruments don't have as many uh, different categories, really. They're a little bit more straightforward. But then when we get to percussion, we have the pitched percussion instruments and the non-pitched, or as the book classifies them, uh, instruments of definite pitch and instruments of indefinite pitch. Right? Basically, percussion instruments that produce noises versus those that produce tones or pitches. Okay, so that's like your, your big breakdown, and then each of the different, different instruments kind of fit within those categories. The book also gets into a little bit um, the keyboard instruments. Now, keyboard is kind of an artificial category because the keyboard does not make the sound, right? In the same way that in a stringed instrument, the string is the source of the sound, or in a woodwind instrument, the wind, the air inside of the tube is the source of the sound. Um, keyboard instruments are all really other types of instruments, other families, uh, members of other families that happen to be controlled by a keyboard. So a piano really is, depending on how you think of it, it's either a stringed instrument or a percussion instrument. It's kind of a hybrid. It has strings inside of it, but those strings are hit by little hammers inside the piano. When you touch a key, a little felt-tipped hammer comes up and whacks the strings. A pipe organ is really a wind instrument, a traditional, a real pipe organ with air going through pipes. That's a wind instrument, but it's controlled by a keyboard instead of blowing into the thing yourself. Um, so, and then they do talk a little bit about electronic instruments. They talk a little bit about synthesizers. We will talk about MIDI, M-I-D-I. We'll talk a little bit about sampling, right? So next time, We'll uh, do a little examination of musical instruments. I might put up some, some videos on D2L to help with that. But um, it's pretty straightforward. You just have to read through this chapter, look at the pictures, and keep in mind that breakdown of the, the four main families, strings, uh, woodwinds, brass, percussion. In fact, here in this, this picture, that I held up earlier. Okay, so you've got a, a picture of a modern symphony orchestra there. Down here, you've got a graphic. And notice how the uh, each of the different families has a different color, right? So the strings have all this kind of, I don't know, peach color, and then this sort of, I don't know, what is that, periwinkle? <laughs> this lighter kind of purple for the woodwinds, this darker purple for the brass, and this kind of greenish color for the percussion, right? By the way, the brass and the woodwinds are sometimes lumped together into a larger family called the wind instrument because all of them involve air going through a tube of some kind. But we could break that down into woodwind versus brass. Okay. So next time, a little bit more about instruments, and, and then we'll get into other aspects of music like rhythm, melody, harmony, etc. Okay, see you then.